Hello and welcome to the 55th episode of the Ultimate Health Podcast. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman and we are here to take your health to the next level. Today we are coming to you for this intro from Phoenix Airport. We're about to board our plane in about half an hour flying back to Toronto after a week vacation where we got some rest and relaxation in. We spent the majority of the time in Scottsdale, Arizona, but we also took a couple of days and went to the beautiful Sedona and really had a great time doing some hiking there and just taking in all the beautiful red rock and rock formations. Today on the show, we have a great guest, Tim Van Orden from runningraw.com. You may remember him from our mini cast a while back where we did a fun impromptu short show with him outside of the Raw Vegan Festival in Toronto. Today we have a full-length show, great interview. Before we get into the details of what we talk about and what Tim's all about, we're going to talk about our sponsor. Yeah, so I'm going to give a little shout out to Sun Warrior, which is never too difficult. Um, So as Jesse mentioned, we are just uh, coming back home from our vacation. And what's amazing is that while we were traveling, we were able to have our Sun Warrior fix no matter where we were. But first of all, what I did bring with us, of course, I always bring some sample packs of Sun Warrior with me, but I bought some of the Sun Warrior Ormus Super Greens. So you can get those in little to-go packets and no matter where you're going to, whether it's just on the go during the day, whether you're commuting or traveling, they're really easy to bring with you and just slide a packet right into your water or into your morning drink. So that was really easy for Jesse and I to have pretty much every day of the vacation. We still made a version of our morning elixir and we had that. So the Orma Super Greens, you know, cleansing, alkalizing, detoxifying and helps get our day started. But also while we went to uh, some of our favorite places and our favorite restaurants, and I'm going to give a quick shout out to some of the incredible places around Arizona that uh, were able to accommodate us in terms of smoothies and superfoods and all the awesome plant-based foods that we eat. And a lot of them had Sun Warrior protein available. So in Sedona, we went to somewhere called the local juicery and it was amazing. We had an acai bowl, we had smoothies, we had juices. They have a lot of bulletproof products as well. So that was great. And there's a place called Kaleidoscope juicery in Scottsdale, Arizona. So we were able to get lots of smoothies there and uh, they had Sun Warrior too. It was delicious. It was amazing and easy to be able to nourish ourselves for breakfast. And the last place that I want to give a shout out to was the Pomegranate Cafe. Amazing, amazing restaurant and they have Sun Warrior as well for an option for a smoothie. So it's good to know that so many different places across the US and Canada now have Sun Warrior as an option. So sometimes you don't need to worry about even bringing it with you. You can just do your research ahead of time and see what uh, these restaurants have. So Jesse's going to let you guys know how to get your hands on some of the products and especially the Sun Warrior protein, the classic protein, which is our fave. Yeah, so if you guys want to take advantage of a 10% discount on your Sun Warrior order, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW, and that is for our Canadian and American listeners. And if you order over $100, you're going to get free shipping. So really great deal. Go take advantage of that. And back to our guest today, Tim Van Orden. We got into a whole bunch of great stuff with Tim. We talk about his injury. We mentioned in the minicaster, he mentioned that he was dealing with an injury. So we get into the details of that. We get into how he's modified his exercise since the injury. We get into salads really in depth. We talk about making an epic, sustainable, delicious salad and get into all kinds of strategies, how you can do that. And we get into talking about the brain. Tim's really big into psychology and happiness and he's battled with depression and he's managed to keep that in check and and come through on the other side with some of these strategies and tips we're going to talk about on today's show. So a really well-rounded interview. Tim is a great guy. We had a lot of fun chatting with him. You guys are going to love it. So without further ado, we're going to get right into things here with Tim Van Orden. Hey, Tim, how are you doing today? Welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast. It's a pleasure to be here, Jesse and Marnie. Yeah, Good we're morning. Ha- Good morning. We're happy to have you back on the show. It was great to meet you in person a couple of weeks ago here in Toronto. And we previously had you on for a little mini cast, which I know people loved. And now we're going to get a little bit deeper with you. 
Yeah, I'm excited to have a more intimate conversation without birds flying overhead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was something. If people don't know the uh, reference there, go back and have a listen to Tim's mini cast. We had uh, a mini cast outdoors and a little unexpected surprise, which made it for uh, an exciting talk. Yes. So, Tim, you mentioned last time, and we didn't elaborate on this, an injury and how that's affecting your training. You've been known to do a lot of endurance running, some snowshoeing. Can you tell us what happened there? What what type of injury and how has that affected your training? Yeah, this is something that really needs to be explained well because people jump to conclusions so quickly. The types of races that I were training for were mountain running, stair climbing, really intense races that require a lot of vertical. So I was running up mountains every single day. And that puts an enormous amount of stress on the Achilles tendon. And this is something that people that train for these events uh, have to deal with. Uh, I went a little too far. I overdid it and started developing um, a fraying in the tendon where the tendon starts to, to break down a tear. And I wasn't giving it adequate time to recover. And uh, after about a year of continually running through pain there, uh, my body decided that the best course of action was to start depositing calcium in the tendon to solidify it so that it wouldn't rupture. Had my tendon ruptured earlier, I'd be much better off because that is something that you can actually heal from. When a tendon snaps, they can surgically reconnect it and then it'll grow back and be just as strong as it ever was. But when a tendon starts to calcify, that's it. There's no coming back from that. Uh, so I have bone in my tendon now. It's basically bone spurs throughout the tendon, and it's very, very painful to run. So is that affecting both tendons or just on one side? Just on my left side. Okay. A big part of your life was doing all this running and yeah. these intense workouts. So how has that changed your day-to-day -day life, and how are you continuing to keep your body fit? It's changed it dramatically. And this is both a good and bad thing. Uh, it's a bad thing because my identity was wrapped up in training two to four hours a day and running up a mountain every single day and often making videos while running up mountains. That was the life I had. And, and I really embraced it. And that inspired a lot of other people. And here I am suddenly finding my place, myself in a place where I can't do that. I can't train two to four hours a day. And I can't be that guy that everybody expects me to be. I've got to find a new way to present myself to the world. Uh, I can't be the athlete that I was. So it's been a, a huge shift in identity for me. And there's been um, a lot of time at home, sitting in front of a computer, working, researching, writing. And to me, that's not uh, very fulfilling. It, it definitely helps me move what I'm doing forward. But it's so dramatically different than the experience that I had as an athlete and being physically active that it's been a huge, uh, huge learning curve. And I'm learning how to reinvent myself as an active person now. And this, uh, I've started a new series on YouTube just a couple days ago about me engaging in this process of becoming an athlete again, but a very different kind of athlete. And how has your eating transformed over the years? So this is, you know, a physical aspect that's changed your body. So in terms of your eating habits and, you know, lifestyle choices overall, what's transformed with that? Well, really good question. When I started this project 10 years ago, it was all about eating for performance. I was trying everybody's diet out there, all the raw gurus who had their books. And at that time, there weren't many. There were maybe four or five. I tried each of their diets and looked at how it affected my performance as an athlete and found that no one single book or methodology or guru had the answer, that it was a combination. I took little pieces from each one of them and assembled what I found to give me the best performance. That doesn't mean it'll work for everybody, but I had to go through that experimentation for myself. So for years, I ate a diet that maximized my performance, uh, which was primarily uh, green smoothies, lots of fresh fruit, big salads, and those salads would often be quite heavy in fat. So it's kind of a hybrid diet between different camps in the raw vegan world. But now that uh, I'm not training like I was, I've had to shift my diet for several reasons. Number one, uh, I'm not getting the emotional satisfaction from exercise that I was before. 
So I've had to lean a little bit more on food than I was in the past. Food used to be primarily fuel for me. Uh, it wasn't about entertainment at all. But now suddenly food has to take up some of that entertainment for me. So I've been eating uh, a little differently so that food is allowing me to feel a little bit better. And this is what most people do. I think they lean very heavily on food to give them comfort, to give them some form of entertainment or positive experience. And I've noticed myself doing that as well. So that gives me insight in helping people that are in that situation rather than telling people, hey, just eat for performance. Well, that's great if you're able to engage in life in a way that uh, you're really fulfilled by being active. Then sure, you don't need food to give you that fulfillment. But if you don't have that thing that you can fully immerse yourself in and fully engage in, then food's going to have to pick up some of the slack. So that's where I find myself now. So the, the changes that have occurred, still doing smoothies, I'm still doing salads, but on occasion there might be some rice added to that salad. There might be some tempeh added to that salad. Uh, I've started adding chia seeds to my smoothie, which is something I never did when I was training full-time. Uh, I didn't eat a lot of nuts or seeds during my full-time training, but now uh, I want those smoothies to be a little bit creamier, a little bit fattier. I get more enjoyment out of that. And that's interesting because chia seeds are used so much as like a power food for endurance. Yeah. Was it yeah. that you didn't know much about them at that time or there was, it was just a restriction, something you just didn't let your body have? Well, there's a lot of people that talk about endurance and a lot of people, you know, born to run. They talk about the Taramahara Indians uh, using chia seeds as one of their staple fuels. And there is some degree of truth to that. But for me as an athlete, it was all about I need to train very quickly after eating. So if the food is going to take a long time to digest, then it's not going to work for me because I'm going to have a lot of blood going to digestion and I need all that blood going to my muscles, lungs, and heart. So chia seeds, although they are a great source of essential fatty acids and the fat calories are uh, good for endurance, they're not immediately available. Uh, those longer chain omega-3 fats take a really long time to break down. So it's not a quick fuel. It's a fuel that'll get you through an entire day of running, but it's not a fuel that's going to be available for you to run 20 kilometers in the next 20 minutes. So Tim, other than including these chia seeds, tempeh, was there any other modifications you've made more recently? Well, also, uh, yeah, I've added sweet potatoes on occasion steamed broccoli, things like that. I wasn't doing any steaming or boiling of foods, but now I incorporate steamed and boiled foods. But it's usually or almost entirely added to a salad. So a salad is still my staple dinner, but now I will add the steamed broccoli, uh, boiled rice, um, you know, boiled potatoes. I don't bake anything still. I don't fry or grill or roast any of the high temperature uh, cooking methods. I stay clear of those, but boiling and steaming are non-toxic. Uh, and as long as you're consuming the water, uh, if you're boiling something, then you're not losing the nutrients because many of them end up in the water. So if you make a tea out of the water or make that part of a dressing, you're all good. And uh, so I've kind of just amped up my salads a bit. Well, I think a lot of people, when they think salad, they're thinking small bed of greens <laughs> on the side yeah. of their plate. Yeah. And I know I've heard you talk about your salads and videos and they're pretty epic. And I'm the same way. I like to make a nice big hearty salad and, and have that as my dinner a yeah. lot of nights. It's, it's quite amazing. You can make delicious hearty salads. So can you give the listeners an idea of what one of your salads looks like? Yeah, that's a really good point, Jesse. My salad is a meal and it's not just a meal. It's a large meal. It's a meal that you're going to take an hour to an hour and a half to eat. If you try to eat it in half an hour, you're not going to be a happy camper. You really have to take your time with it. So I will take an entire head of red leaf lettuce, chop it up really good. And right now we've got a lot of greens growing in our garden here. So then I'll go out and pick another entire bowl full of all different types of baby greens. And I will mix that up with the red leaf lettuce. And I chop it up all really small. I'll grate uh, two big carrots in there. I'll grate four or five radishes in there. Uh, if I'm not steaming some broccoli, I'll take some broccoli and I'll grate just the flowers off of the heads so I don't get the stems of the broccoli, but just the, the top parts. They're like little seeds when you grate them off. I'll grate up a cucumber or zucchini. So we're talking a lot of volume of vegetables here. 
uh, it usually works out to about a kilo. And then I'll add a whole avocado, and then my dressing is usually uh, some kind of acid, whether it be a citrus juice or an apple cider vinegar mixed with a, a really high quality um, olive oil, then some nutritional yeast, uh, maybe some sea salt, and then some maple syrup to uh, balance out the, the bitterness of the acid. And that's my standard salad. I very rarely vary from that. And again, it's, we're talking a kilo worth of salad here. The biggest salad bowl you've got, I will fill it. And, uh, and then sometimes I'll even, as I said, add some, some rice to that, add some tempeh, add some sweet potato chopped up, and I will take my time eating that. It sounds amazing. And if, you know, it, I really encourage my clients as well, too. It's so important to just to make that base of a meal being green or being vegetable yeah, based. Yep. And then, yeah, you add in you add in the fun stuff or the little bits here, quinoa, <clears throat> rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes, tempeh. But, yeah, having a big bowl of that is just, especially this time of year, you know, it's in North America, yeah. means summer, yeah. spring. This is kind of what yeah. we crave for dinner and want. And it's perfect fuel because, as you said, it takes an hour to eat, so your body's going to digest that well. And then, you know, whatever someone's goal is, I feel like a meal like that can fulfill that whether it's, you know, weight loss, whether it's training or whatever it is, it's like, it's the perfect meal. Thank you for sharing that. It sounds delicious. Yeah. And I've got a client that I work with who he's a meat eater and that's great. I'm not going to say, Hey, you have to give up meat today right now. So what I do instead is like, let's build a salad. We're going to build the base of a salad. And if you still want your meat, let's chop it up into small pieces. Let's add it to the salad. So we're still getting the base of his nutrients coming from that salad. And then he can add whatever he wants to it. We'll slowly wean him off with that base of greens always being the foundation. And I think a lot of people feel like having a salad like that, they feel deprived. And I know like as you're explaining the salad, I'm starting to salivate and think about dinner later and it gets me really excited. So I'm assuming likewise for you, when you're building and and consuming these salads it's not like you're you're doing it out of just health like you're enjoying it right yeah i really look forward to my salad i really really do there's no deprivation at all there's no discipline involved it's not about being strict it's not about avoiding certain foods i really love that salad i look forward to it and again people are going to think well there's no way I'm going to enjoy a meal of salad or yes, I am going to feel deprived or I'm going to feel like I haven't eaten enough. I'm not going to be full. It's like, well, you haven't tried this salad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And give it time too, right? You have yeah. to experiment yeah. with different ingredients and get the ratios right and exactly. allow those taste buds to get used to these different things that typically aren't in most people's diets. Yep. And you know, another thing that's really important that uh, most people overlook when people interact with a salad the leaves and the chunks of broccoli and the cucumber and the carrot and tomato are often very large. So they're eating, they take a bite and they've got just cucumber in their mouth because it was a giant piece or they have just broccoli in their mouth or just carrot in their mouth and they don't get to experience all those flavors coming together, which is why I grate everything. And that's why I chop the lettuce too. So you really distribute the flavors throughout every bite. But even more importantly than that, the dressing People put dressing on the top of their salad. They seldom toss it themselves. You can go to a restaurant and they'll toss it, but most people just pour dressing on the top. So they get these top leaves excessively coated with dressing. They eat that, and the leaves underneath don't have any dressing on them. So what do they do? They add more. Mm -hmm. And they end up adding so much dressing that they're overwhelmed by the vinegar. They've consumed so much vinegar, or they've consumed so much fat, and now, and they really don't feel good about eating the salad because they kept adding the dressing to every layer of leaves that they were eating. And now they're like, oh God, I feel terrible. So what I do is I take that mass of ingredients in that bowl, you know, a kilo of salad, variety of vegetables, and my dressing is pretty minimal, but I toss it and toss it and toss it. I'd say three to five minutes. I will toss that salad with two very large forks for three to five minutes until every piece of that salad has been thoroughly marinated with the dressing I put on there. And then you're not overwhelmed by too much vinegar or too much oil. And you get, the, again, those flavors evenly distributed. And then it's a very, very, very positive experience that you walk away with. 
That's a very good tip because that is very true. I think people do get intimidated by the large chunks in salad. And when you break yeah. it down, and even if you get your hands in there with something like kale and massage it yeah. and yeah. totally change the consistency of it, yeah. it's, it's a whole new experience. And I think people also need to get used to that with you know, a largely plant-based diet or big salad meals, you got to do a lot of chewing yeah. and you got to <laughs> chew, chew, which is probably why it takes you an hour to eat too. Cause you got to really chew that stuff down that roughage. And some people I think find go through a bit of a transition where they find, Oh, you know, I ate that salad and I'm so bloated or so uncomfortable. It's going to take your body a little bit of time to, uh, you know, get used to that fiber load to push things yeah. through. So I just want to mention that if someone goes and makes the salad right after, you know, give yourself time, do, do it for a couple of weeks, get your body used to it. But breaking yeah. it down, what you said, Tim is amazing. And I think that's a great tip for people to take away is to chop everything up super tiny and coat it with, you know, lemon juice, apple cider vinegar, olive oil, and get it all mixed in there. That's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, you also bring up a really good point, Marnie. The lining of our stomach and our intestines changes about every three to five days. So we're going to be producing a different mixture of digestive enzymes depending on the cells that we have in that lining. They respond to the foods that we're eating. So in three to five days, the cells that we have have been sloughed off and we produce new ones that are much more responsive to the foods that we're currently eating. So number one, it can take three to five days for your digestive system to adapt by producing new types of cells that have a, a certain amount of enzyme mix that they produce. But more importantly, the microbiota, the bacteria living in your gut, and gut means stomach all the way down through the colon, that, that's all called your gut different bacteria living in different parts, they change as well depending on what you're eating. So if you're generally eating a lot of processed foods and you're eating a lot of animal products and you start incorporating salad, the bacteria that you have in your gut are not bacteria that will help you deal with that salad, the fiber in the salad. So there, yeah, there's going to be some bloating. There's going to be some, I don't quite know what to do with this stuff coming in. But the more of that fiber that you eat, the more you'll start building a gut bacteria that can handle those fibers and you'll start digesting them more effectively. So yeah, it really does take time to and, switch over. And I think it's important to embrace the fact that this process takes time. I mean, yeah. we're also rush, 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 or I mean, there's some people that might not be, but the majority of us are rushing around, dinner becomes a chore making dinner, and we're all rushing through the meal and on to the next thing. So I love the whole idea of making it almost uh, like a dynamic meditation when you're putting this meal together and taking your time either with yourself and your thoughts or with a group of people to really chew and, and make it an experience. Yeah, Jesse, that is so critical. I'm so glad you bring that up. Making the salad to me is a meditative act. It's about me claiming my space and claiming my time. You just said, take your time. People say those three words without ever really thinking about them. If you slow it down and really think, take your time, that's an aggressive act. I'm taking it. I'm claiming it. And whose time is it? It's mine. Take your time doesn't mean do things slowly. Take your time means own the time in this moment. Own it. It's yours. Take it. Be present to it. Savor it. Soak it in. This salad is creating my body. This salad becomes me, not just physically, but it becomes my experience. It becomes my life. So I am nurturing myself in this moment. When I'm touching that salad, I'm actually nurturing me. So I really get present to that. And I, I do take my time and I create myself in those moments. And that to me is a, a spiritual experience. That's great, Tim. And I want to take a step back because... I just want to dig a little bit more into this new YouTube channel that you're <laughs> just starting. And I still want to get a little bit more into what exactly you're doing to keep your body fit. Because this has got to be a big change. Your body, like you said, you're out for hours pushing your body. Your cardiovascular endurance must have been insane, like in a great way. But now it must be a shock either way with the changes you've made. What is it you're doing with this channel and how are you moving your body? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I would go into the doctor for various checkups over the you know, past few years. And when I was in that highest training mode up until the age of 45, two years ago, I'd go into the doctor and I'd have to tell them, hey, I'm an endurance athlete, so your measurements are going to be really wonky, so please don't get scared. <laughs> you know? 
like they take your pulse and my resting pulse was 38. But in a doctor's office, I'm not going to be as low as a 38, but maybe I might be 44. So they take my pulse and it's a 44 and they're like, oh my God, you're in, dude, you're going to die. Or they take my blood pressure and it would be 90 over 60. And they're like, wow, your blood pressure's through the floor. And it's like, no, 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 I'm an athlete. It's okay. It's okay. So recently when I went in to get my checkup with uh, the Lyme disease that I contracted, they took my blood pressure and they're like, oh, it's 120 over 80. And I'm like, oh no, my blood pressure is so high. And they're like, what are you talking about? That's perfect. I'm like, no, 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 that's high. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I could really start to see the differences that have occurred in my body because I'm not putting in that level of activity. So what my activity level looks like now and how that relates to my YouTube channel, I found that it's inspiring to people if you create this larger than life character, this persona of the ultimate athlete or the, you know, raw vegan superstar, whatever. Not necessarily that I ever thought of myself that way, but people tend to put you on a pedestal of their own liking, their own design. And that was inspiring to a lot of people. But at the same time, they couldn't relate to me. They're like, Tim is, he's doing this great stuff for us, but he's not like us. Like you watch a game on TV, whether you know, you're a hockey fan, it's Canada. So you guys hockey fans? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come to playoff time a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So you can look at these people on TV and feel a sense of pride because they're your team, but you're not like them and you wouldn't ever want to get on the court and play with them. Yet you identify like, yay, they're doing it for me and I'm living vicariously through them, but it's not helping me uh, move forward in my life. Like I'm not progressing. I'm just watching them progress. I'm watching them break Olympic records or world records, but I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about them doing it. So, yeah, it was great that I created this athletic persona, but I really wanted to change people's lives. I really wanted to meet them where they were and help them take a step, and that wasn't doing it. So this is why I started talking about depression, and this is why I created my Getting Started series at the end of 2011, to show people, hey, look, I'm human. Like, yeah, I've got all these national championships and you know records around the country, but I'm still human and I still have to get up every day and I still have challenge and these are the things that I deal with and my life is far from perfect. And there are days that I don't want to do it and there are days that I want to quit and there are days that I just want to sit there and cry. You know, and I'm wondering what's the point? So I started talking about that so that I could give them something to relate to like, hey, look, I'm in this place and maybe you're feeling the exact same stuff. So I'm going to show you how I get out of it. I'm going to show you how I deal with it so that I can go on to win those national championships. You know, because if you look at it, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step and people can celebrate the thousand miles like, wow, you did a thousand miles, yay. But the person that did the thousand miles is really thinking, well, every step was just as value as the crossing the finish line because without any of those steps, I never would have made it to the finish line. So you really learn to celebrate the process. And I'm, now I'm trying to show people even more so how to celebrate that process rather than fantasizing about the finish line, fantasizing about the product or the result. It's like, no, let's celebrate the process. We're a culture that's addicted to love, but we've forgotten how to like. So we love the result, we love the person, but we don't like the person. We don't like the process. Very interesting point and really, you know, kind of deep and I think really important for, you know, the people who've been subscribing to you for years to hear that message because this is who you are and to be able to connect with them on this level and get real about, you know, what you're going through and what you're experiencing is is so important. So I want to kind of jump into something you mentioned with the Lyme disease because yeah. I'm sure that's something that really kind of shook your core and when you you know, realize, I want to hear more about that. This is something we haven't really talked much about on the podcast or that Jesse and I, you know, know too much about. And it's interesting because I'm hearing more and more people um, <laughs> experiencing it or having it. Yeah. And let's talk about that. How did you first find out and what has that done to your health? Well, this is something that uh, we've had to interact with here in Vermont, maybe for the past 10 years. Prior to that, we did not have these ticks. They've moved in. Uh, over the past 10 years, and they weren't in Canada until a couple of years ago, but now they're in Canada. So you guys are going to see that more and more on your radar locally. But uh, here in Vermont, it is epidemic. In the United States, Vermont has the highest per capita incidence of Lyme disease. 
uh, of any of the states. And that's primarily because we don't have any cities, so just about everybody in the state interacts with a rural environment somehow, to some degree, whereas New York City, nobody is going to be interacting with ticks in New York City. So New York is taken out of the equation, even though they have a greater number of incidents than Vermont does. But my family, just about everybody in the family's had it. My dad's had it three times. My mom's had it twice. Uh, so I was, I've been waiting to get it. It's like my, you know, I was waiting for my number to be called. And... I caught it really quickly because we are so hyper vigilant here. And that is an advantage of living in an area where it is so common is that people are really hyper vigilant. We are trained to check ourselves for ticks several times throughout the day to do a full body scan. Uh, you do it when you wake up in the morning because ticks can migrate across your bedding. They might have gotten into your bedding the night before. Uh, maybe you had some clothes on, you threw the clothes on the bed, you know, before, and then you, you moved them somewhere else, but maybe there was a tick on your clothes and now it's in your bed. You wake up and you might have an embedded tick. So we check ourselves in the morning, we check ourselves midday, we check ourselves after shower, we check ourselves before we go to bed. And so we're really good about checking, but still, that doesn't mean that you're going to catch every tick. And if they've been on you for a day, 24 hours, they can transmit the disease. So I found the tick, uh, it was really swollen. And then a couple of days later, it started to itch, and I got the, the bullseye. It's like a bullseye rash that emanates out from the tick. And that's a, a surefire way to tell that you have Lyme disease. But not everybody gets that bullseye. So some people can have a tick bite and not get the bullseye, develop Lyme, and not even know it. And then two months later, they start feeling the symptoms. Or a couple of weeks later, they'll get, it feels like a fever. They've got headaches. Their joints ache. They're nauseous. They have low energy. And they could attribute it to some other illness and not get the Lyme test. And this ends up with um, or results in permanent uh, neurological damage and permanent joint damage. So thankfully, I had the, the bullseye. So I went in, got checked, and they're like, yep, you've got Lyme. So Tim, a couple things that come up for me, questions as you're explaining. So the tick actually has to be on your body for a lengthy period of time before yeah. it's going to embed itself? Because I think a lot of people, when we think of getting bit by, say, like a fly or getting bit by a mosquito, that happens relatively quickly. And it sounds like these have to be on your skin for a period of time. Well, we still don't know everything about this disease. We're still in the infancy. We're learning a lot. But the ticks can be walking around your body for a long period of time. I've been outside, say, at noon, and then uh, I come in the house and I'm working on the computer for six hours straight, so it's now 6 p.m., and here's a tick walking up my leg that was probably on my sock or on my shoe for the past six hours, and then it decided to take a walk, and here it is walking up my thigh, and I can feel it walking up my thigh, and that's how I notice it. Uh, so they can be, you can check yourself, you know, you can look at your legs when you come in the house and not see any, but that doesn't mean they're not on your shoes or socks. So there's the fact that they don't immediately embed themselves on you, but also when they do embed in your skin, you won't feel it because they anesthetize your skin. They inject a chemical that numbs you so you don't feel them biting. And it takes a while for them to do what they need to do to get properly embedded before they really start taking on blood. The general thought is that you've got about 24 hours before 24 hours of them being embedded before they will transmit the disease. But that's not a perfect number. It could happen sooner. It could happen longer. Could it be years yeah. before someone finds out that they have it? Like they may not feel the tick at all. The tick might fall off and then they don't know until they start experiencing certain health problems. Yeah, this is really common and it's really unfortunate because the, uh, the symptoms look like many other illnesses. And if you live in an area where Lyme is not prevalent, the doctors are not going to be checking for Lyme. So they're going to be looking. They may say, oh, you have chronic fatigue or, or you're depressed or you have fibromyalgia or you have arthritis or you might have some kind of allergy or candida. A lot of people are going to say, oh, it's candida because it looks very similar to what um, the candida tests look like. So in Vermont, where we know that Lyme is uh, epidemic, that's the first thing they check for. But in other areas, the doctors, you know, in Canada, for instance, doctors are not fully familiar with it yet, so they may not even be checking. You might have to urge them, hey, could you please do a Lyme check? 
so yes, if you've had the disease for several years, and there's a lot of talk about this on the internet, and I know people locally as well, it's a really bad thing. You will develop permanent neurological damage and permanent joint damage. So what are some of these tests that the doctors are doing to confirm? It sounds like it's kind of an ambiguous diagnosis that has some overlap with, like you said, fibromyalgia and other conditions. Well, it's only ambiguous if they don't do the blood test. Okay, so, so right away with the blood <clears throat> test, they can confirm? Well, it, uh, not immediately. If you've been bitten and it's been five days uh, since the bite, the test may not show Lyme. And it's a bacteria they call spirochetes. You may not necessarily see the spirochetes in your blood or the antibodies um, or the breakdown products of the spirochetes within five days. But if it's been a week or more, uh, it's most likely going to show up. But it's a good idea to get checked a month later as well, uh, because even within a week, it may not show up in your blood. But yes, there, there is a definite bacteria, uh, and it will eventually show up in your blood. It'll show up positive on a blood test if you have it. But uh, many of the other diseases, yes, they are amb ambiguous. We really don't know how to pinpoint what they are because they're more systemic illnesses, whereas Lyme is a bacteria, the spirochete bacteria. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying that. And you did a really fun video more recently where you're in the bathroom and you're showing <laughs> <laughs> the ticks on your feet and you had numerous ticks embedded. Yeah. Can you talk about <laughs> if you get bit by one of these and they're embedded, are they all containing Lyme disease or is it just like a small percentage of them? It's a small percentage. It's not every tick. But here's another thing, you know, and this, hopefully this podcast is not all doom and gloom. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, we can, we can take it to the positive very we'll, we'll soon. It, we're going to bring it back to the positive. But ticks are vectors for many diseases. Lyme is just one. Uh, my dad was bitten last year, and he developed Lyme disease and another disease called Ehrlichia from the same bite. The tick was infected by two different microbes. So the Ehrlichia almost killed him. It totally wrecked his liver. So the Lyme uh, gave him flu-like symptoms, gave him joint pain, gave him headaches, and then the Ehrlichia just started eating at his liver. So my dad was in the hospital for quite some time. He was done. So that's another one that's not as common, Ehrlichia. Another one that you really, really need to worry about, or now please don't worry, but be careful of, is tick-borne encephalitis, TBE. And this is really common in Europe. It's not as common in the United States, but it, it is here. Tick-borne encephalitis uh, basically screws up your, uh, your nervous system pretty much permanently. Um, so you do really want to be diligent. You know, if you spend any time outside, you really want to be diligent about checking yourself to make sure that uh, you haven't. So I'm sure that there is a number of people listening who either know someone with Lyme or that they, they themselves have it. So are there some good resources they could look to or, you know, whether it's a book or something that you can just kind of share? Yeah, just New York State has probably done the most research into Lyme because even though Vermont has a higher per capita incidence, New York has the greatest number of incidents. So New York State has really done a great job of researching Lyme and putting out um, some great information online. So you can check the New York State Department of Health or just uh, Google New York State Lyme disease prevention or um, information and that there's a lot of great stuff that the state of New York has put out to help people. Okay. And for the listeners, we'll put links to these in the show notes, along with the summary of everything we're talking about over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. So head over, check that out and enjoy. So Tim, let's, like we said, let's, let's bring <laughs> some happiness and, and change and yeah. shift the gears <laughs> on this interview a little bit here. So I know you're really into psychology research, you're into the brain, and I'm sure you've had a lot of a lot of different ideas come from that into the realm of happiness. So yeah. do you have any direct ideas for people? How can we be more happy and live a better life? Great question. Well, I do a lot of research in this area. And there's a field that has emerged uh, over the past, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years called positive psychology. And the name is a little bit misleading because people immediately think that positive psychology just means positive thinking. Like, I need to have positive thoughts. I need to be happy. I need to not take things so seriously. But that's not what it is at all. Positive psychology is simply 
the answer to all other psychology, which is pathopsychology. See, when people say the term psychology, that field only studies a diseased state of the mind. That's it, pathopsychology, diseased mind, diseased brain. Nobody had studied a highly functioning mind. Nobody had studied uh, a thriving mind, a happy mind. Why should we? These people don't need help. So it's only recently that we've begun to study what makes somebody happy, what makes somebody thrive, what creates well-being in somebody. So this new field of positive psychology has emerged to study these beneficial states of mind. What does an advanced mind look like? And one of the, uh, the father of this movement, his name is Martin Seligman, the University of Pennsylvania, he wrote a book called Authentic Happiness a while back. And this was his answer to the question that you just asked. And he thought that, uh, based on the research, that happiness is a combination of positive emotions and engagement and meaning. So you could kind of look at it in the opposite order. You find something that has meaning to you, you engage in it fully, and this creates positive emotions. And he deems this authentic happiness. That without that meaning or without that engagement, you might have positive emotions, but they're going to be fleeting. They're not, it's not going to be a state that lasts. You're going to be at the whim of whatever your environment is presenting you with. But if you can find meaning and then engage in it, then you're much more likely to have this resilient, continuous, not continuous state of always being happy, but a state where on your worst day, you're not really depressed or sad. You're still pretty resilient. But over the past few years, he's added a few more levels to this. Uh, and he's got an acronym to describe this called PERMA. And the P stands for the positive emotion. The E stands for engagement. The R stands for relationships. You need to have positive relationships in your life. The M, again, stands for meaning. And the A stands for accomplishment. That if you have something that is meaningful and you're fully engaged in it, but you don't accomplish anything, well, then it just kind of feels empty. Like, why am I doing this? What's the point? So, And the relationship part is if I don't have anybody to share it with, if I can't talk about this, if I can't use it to benefit other people, then why I'm just in a vacuum. So I've gone even further with this. And this is where I am right now. And what I'm up to, I'm taking this to another level. Because uh, one of the things that Martin has not worked with, because scientists, they tend to specialize. He hasn't looked at how food relates ha to happiness and well-being. He has also hasn't looked at how activity relates to happiness or well-being. So, but other people have. There are other scientists that focus primarily on how activity relates to well-being and others that focus primarily on how diet relates to well-being. So I'm taking all of that data together and combining it into um, a new methodology. So it's about eating a clean diet. It's about moving your body. So not only are you engaged in something meaningful, but you're physically engaged in something meaningful as well. Uh, for instance, I listen to all the books and lectures while I'm moving my body. I'm either biking or I'm running or I'm hiking. I'm doing something outside in the world so that I'm engaged in something meaningful while I'm moving my body. And there are so many studies out now showing that physical activity creates new brain cells, that the fastest way to modify your brain in a positive direction is to move your body that there's a, a chemical that the brain produces while exercising called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And BDNF is like miracle grow for the brain. It causes new neurons to grow. It causes neurons that already exist. It causes them to form new connections uh, so you can get a, a greater perspective on things. You're not so stuck in a linear way of thinking, but you can think uh, much more inclusively about things. And uh, these neurons... If you have a meaningful activity that you're engaged in, you'll start to build new neural networks. If you don't have that meaning and you don't have that engagement, you'll produce new neurons and then they just die because they have nothing to do. So, and, and again, diet comes into play here too. If your brain is properly nourished, if it's getting all the nutrients that it needs, if it's getting all the oxygen that it needs, if it's... Um, not being attacked by the toxins in your diet, this process is even faster and more effective. So you're, you're setting yourself up with food and activity with this brain that's like growing constantly. 
then you apply that growing brain to meaningful activity that you're fully engaged with and then socially sharing with and boom, you've got happiness, you've got well-being, you've got an incredible life. So interesting. This is obviously super applicable to people who are suffering from depression. Yes. And is this something that's being, you know, talked about or used as, as therapy or working with people because, you know, obviously drugs are dominating that market. So how can we get movement and diet <laughs> becoming the core of, of healing people from this? That is my mission because as of yet, that does not exist as a healing modality in the uh, scientific framework of things. You've got specialists in psychology, psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, psychopharmaceutical medication. Then you've got people that are exercise therapists. Then you've got people that are nutritionists. And the three of them have not come together yet, which is what I'm up to. Well, the other thing too, Tim, is I'm sure a lot of what you get your happiness from is having this message you're so passionate about and sharing it with others. This kind of fits into what you're talking about here. So it's great that you've created this this lifestyle for yourself where you do have the food that's the best ever and exercise and you have a message you're sharing with with the masses. Yeah. And you know, to to get back to that earlier, Marnie just made a comment about drugs, medication being one of the um Right now, in psychiatry, that's the predominant approach. That deals with symptoms. It is not a cure. Psychopharmaceutical medication does not cure anybody. It just changes chemistry so that someone can continue to exist in an environment that is harming them, can continue to exist in an identity that is harming them or in relationships that is harming them, can continue to live a life without meaning or engagement. And our culture supports this. I'm not saying our culture supports mental illness directly, like I want you to be mentally ill, but indirectly, the decisions that our culture makes promote this uh, a lack of well-being. Uh, so what I'm up to and what many of these other people are up to in their own individual way is creating real well-being really changing the brain on a physical level, on an emotional level, on a mental level, a spiritual level, actually causing real change rather than simply just dealing with symptoms. You know, it's like uh, uh, somebody gets hurt in a a football game and they ice up their, you know, they ice up the joint, they spray it with something that numbs it, and then they send them back in the game. Well, the, the, the knee is still injured you know, whatever it was that got hurt, they're still injured. And now they don't even know that they're doing further damage to it because they're numbed up. So a lot of the medications we take are just numbing us up so that we can continue in an activity that we shouldn't be doing to begin with. Well, Tim, as you mentioned earlier, briefly, you've dealt with depression over the years. And obviously, you're applying this stuff that you're learning. And what have you noticed over time? How has this positively influenced your situation and and your depression? Dramatically, profoundly. (laughs) And this is something that uh, I've only seen reflected in Buddhist teachings. So what I study is not just psychology and science, biochemistry and, and neuroscience. I also study Buddhist philosophy because they've been thinking about these things for thousands of years. Or, or maybe 1,500 years. So what I've come to understand and have also personally experienced is that depression is not a disease, at least not initially. It is a response. It is a healing response. It is a grounding. In fact, it's even in the word depression, to depress. We tend to live in, uh, live in an identity that's much bigger than we are capable of um, dealing with. We, we spend more money on credit than we are capable of earning. Uh, we drive cars that we can't afford. We have houses that we can't afford. We dress up for our friends and then dress very differently when we're home alone. We clean the house when somebody comes over and then we let it be all messy when it's just us. Like We are constantly trying to present this image of ourselves that's inflated, that's not our real self. And we don't show our real self to the world. In fact, a lot of the time, we don't even show our real self to us. We even keep it hidden from us. And and we live in this culturally supported delusion. Like you've got to be bigger and better than you actually are. Who you are is not okay. You've got to be more than that. Uh, And if you buy this product, you'll be more than that. And if you have six-pack abs, you'll be more than that. And if you have beautiful skin and this gorgeous flowing hair, well, then you'll be more than that. So you should aspire to be more than who you are. That's what our 
marketing in this culture tells us. So depression is a grounding. It's like it's like a big hand pushing you down onto the ground, getting you out of the clouds, pushing you down to solid earth and saying, hey, I'm going to keep you here until you stop doing that. I'm going to keep you here until you see the value of who you are, until you see that you are enough. You don't need any of that stuff. You don't need to inflate yourself in any way. You're grounded until you get it, until you learn the lesson. Just like a parent grounding a child after they've done something that was harmful or inappropriate. Depression is that parent grounding you and saying, dude, stop it. I'm taking you out of the game. I want you to learn. I want you to take a look. I want you to check in with yourself because what you're doing is hurting you. So please stop. Unfortunately, people see that game outside of them. They see everybody else in this inflated, delusional state and they miss it and they feel bad about themselves and like, I need to get out there again. I need to be out there and and accomplishing all these crazy things that aren't really going to give me well-being, but at least I'm pretending that I'm part of the group. And uh, this is when it becomes a disease because we don't accept ourselves in those moments. We don't value ourselves in those moments of depression. We start loathing ourselves. We see ourselves as weaker than other people rather than seeing ourselves as, well, I'm perfect as I am. And because I'm now on solid ground, thanks to this depression, I can actually take real steps that make a real difference in my life. But when I'm floating up on cloud nine with my head in the clouds with these gigantic dreams, well, I can't actually take real steps because I'm not on the ground. Because I have to be present to what I'm actually able to do in this step. And I have to be present to what ingredients I actually have to work with in this step. You know, depression is an honesty. And if you look at the brain uh, and fMRI scans of the brain, people that are depressed have a very active right side of their prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is the very front part of your brain. It's the most advanced human part of your brain, the cognitive part. Well, the right and left behave very differently. People that are depressed are very active on the right side. People that are really happy are very active on the left side. But what they've also found is that when people have a very right active prefrontal cortex, they're incredibly honest. And when people have a very active left prefrontal cortex, they lie to themselves all the time. They lie to others. They don't even realize that they're lying because they also lie to themselves. The left side loves to make things up. It loves to fantasize. It loves to tell stories. It loves to dream big. It loves to approach things and say, I can do it. I can take on the world. I'm the greatest person. And the right side is all about honesty. And depression is that honesty. So you don't want to stay there on that right side. What you want to do is team up with the left and say, hey, dude, okay, look, we've got to be honest about who we are, what we're capable of, and what we have to work with. But you know, I'm going to include you in this conversation so that we can actually make some progress, so that we can actually enjoy what we've got and actually turn it into something better. The left side, sorry, the right side doesn't create possibility. It just shows you what it is. The left side creates possibility. So what you want is a left brain that's creating with what the right brain is showing it rather than creating out of thin air. Well, Tim, I think a big part of this too is the social media, the internet, everybody being able to pick and choose what everybody is seeing of them day to day. Yeah. And curating. Yeah, exactly. We're picking the best of the best and then we're throwing a filter on it and then we're taking our time to come up with the perfect <laughs> description of what is happening and then we're sending it out to the world and we're all part of this game like you've explained. So what are some of the first steps of accepting ourselves for who we truly are and although it might be scary, how do we start putting our true selves out into the world, whether that be online or in our daily interactions? That's a really good point, Jesse. Uh, one of the things that we're discovering in psychology is that, or neuroscience, is that our brains are social engines. That is why we are as smart as we are. That is why the human brain can do more than any other brain on the planet, because we are social beings. So we don't have the brain that we do to solve math problems. We don't have the brain that we do to build bridges or the CN Tower. We have the brain that we do to manage social networks, large social networks. 
So the vast majority of our thinking is filtered through that social part of the brain. The first step is to realize that your brain is doing this, that your brain is really, really, really intensely focused on the social world. Um, so we can't beat ourselves up for being that way because it's just the way the brain is set up. You know, it's nobody's fault that we do this, which is the first step to realize that it's not you. You are not broken. You are not weak. You are not undisciplined. You don't lack willpower. You simply have a human brain because a lot of people, they, they're afraid of them, their true selves because they think that it's them. Like there's this individual identity called Tim and he is somehow inferior to other people. When the reality is that that's simply my social brain trying to figure out where I fit into this network. Where do I fit in the hierarchy? It's just doing some calculations. And unfortunately, in Western culture, those calculations become our identity. This does not happen in Eastern cultures. In Western cultures, we have what they call an independent self-focus. In Eastern cultures, they have what's called an interdependent self-focus. So the self in a Western mind is very different than the self in an Eastern mind. So we've got a culture that is forcing us to focus on us as an individual. And then we have a brain that's telling us what our rank is in that group. And those two things come together to create an identity, which is really illusory. It's not who we are. It's just this mixture of brain and culture. And we, we think that that's who we are. And it's not who we are. Uh, it's just the trick our brain is playing on us. So to get underneath that, you practice what psychologists now call self-compassion. And this is actually a science. It's not just fun words to say. Self-compassion is, it's about being kind to yourself. It's about realizing that you have a common humanity, meaning that uh, you have a brain just like everybody else. And this is what brains do. So don't feel bad about your brain doing this because everybody else's brain is doing it as well. It's not you that's broken. And you can start building this loving, supportive voice inside your head that's kind to you. That whenever you have a negative statement that you hear in your own head, you, you say, oh, I'm stupid, or I'm fat, or I'm ugly, or I can't do this, or I'm weak, nobody will like me. You realize that, okay, that's just one region in the brain doing its job really well. That's it. That region of the brain just wants to keep you safe. Uh, it wants to make sure that you're included in the group. It's assessed your abilities. The right side has assessed your abilities and says, okay, maybe you're not the strongest person in the room. Maybe you're not the prettiest person in the room. So I'm going to make sure that you don't exceed your actual abilities here because the group will probably look at you like you're crazy or stupid if you do. So I'm going to let you know what your rank is in the room. Not so you feel bad, but just so you can behave appropriately. Just so you don't try to fight the strongest person in the room because you're not the strongest. Or try to compete with the prettiest person in the room because you're not the prettiest. So this is what our brain, it's one region in the brain that's just doing this. It's making that calculation and saying, okay, behave like this because this is your actual rank. But we don't have to listen to that. We can say, okay, that's one region of the brain, but I have all these other regions of the brain too. So that's not my identity. It's simply a calculation the brain made. And guess what? The brain makes mistakes. The brain's not always right because the brain is filtering through our past experience. And even though that past experience might have been really important to pay attention to when it was happening, this bad event happened to us, the neural network that was created in that moment that creates our behavior potentially for the rest of our life, that neural network may no longer be appropriate. Maybe the person that was being harmful to us, maybe that person's no longer in our life. But now our brain has this hardwired network that's going to keep us behaving as if that person is always there. So maybe the brain has ranked us in the room, but we can say, you know what, I'm not, I'm not sure that ranking is appropriate. Very interesting point, because I think a lot of people, you know, fall victim to their circumstances and play up the poor me and, you know, get stuck in that and don't know how to get out of it and unfortunately live their life that way. And I think you're bringing up some really valid points. And I think it's just really important for people to exactly what you said, realize it's not always their fault and it's not always the situation they have to be in. And, and there is a way, there is another way. Yeah, it's not your fault. It's the default. And Tim, I came across this article on the Inc. website not too long ago, and this ties in here with the whole depression thing where entrepreneurs or people out there forming their own businesses, incomes, they have a tendency towards more depression, suicide, anxiety, 
And I just thought that was really interesting because it could be a chicken or egg scenario where certain people are drawn to that kind of that kind of lifestyle or that kind of basically making their living doing that. Or it could be the fact that when you're tied into that state of living, because it is so high stress and and there's so many ups and downs, it can lead to those demons, basically. Yeah, I see two ways to look at that. One is that you've got a sociopath, which uh, is someone that generally does not have a deep connection to their own emotional experience and has almost no connection to other people's emotional experience. And we're finding out now that many business leaders are sociopaths, uh, which makes them very good leaders. Not all sociopaths are violent. They don't all become killers or psychopaths, but many people in leadership positions are sociopaths, which means that they don't feel their own feelings and they don't feel the feelings of others so that they can easily tell somebody what to do. They have no problem controlling people. They have no problem delegating because they don't feel your feelings and they don't even feel their own. So they don't feel any fear or anxiety when they tell you what to do. So this can make them really good leaders because they don't have those hurdles to overcome. But at the same time, we now know that social relationships, a a thriving social network is absolutely essential to human well-being. So if someone is a sociopath, they're never going to feel connected to other people and there's going to be this emptiness in them, which causes them to seek more and more and more power, hoping that they can somehow fill that void, but it never does. So they, yeah, they've accomplished these great things, but they're just empty because they cannot connect with people. And a, a sociopathic brain is actually a different physical type of brain. You can look at it in an fMRI scanner, and it's a different brain physically. Just like there are tall people and there are short people, a sociopath has a different kind of brain. Then we'll we'll move away to another kind of person, the opposite of a sociopath, someone who is very, very, very socially aware, who feels their feelings very deeply, uh, and is highly permeable to other uh, emotions from the outside and their own emotions. And they also feel very isolated because they have this gigantic social pressure from all of this emotional input that they're receiving. So they can't simply make a decision uh, without feeling the emotional impact on themselves and on others. So they tend to isolate themselves and they tend to be uh, start businesses by themselves because they don't know how to work well with others because it's too emotionally challenging to work with others. So they spend 80 to 100 hours a week busting their butts on uh, getting off the ground. They never feel like they're enough because they're watching other people so easily get along and and laugh and they're going out for drinks and everybody's having a good time and here I am just busting my butt and, and working all the time and nobody really gets me and I don't really get them and I'm overwhelmed when I talk to them. This is the introvert versus extrovert equation. These are your introverted, you know, success stories there's a sense of inadequacy because they don't have that easy sense of interaction that an extrovert naturally does. So they can achieve, 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 achieve. And they also have a sense of emptiness because they feel disconnected from the people that they're with, not because they don't feel those people, but because they feel them too much and they, they, they feel like they're being left out. And it's, it's really sad. And this is the type of person that I've learned that I am. I'm that incredibly sensitive introvert. And that has, always been the catalyst for my depression but now it's something that i'm learning to work with instead of saying oh i'm shy and therefore nobody likes me or i'm highly sensitive and then i'm afraid of confrontation i've begun to acknowledge and recognize oh this is one part of my brain that's just warning me about something this is one part of my brain that's advising me about something but that doesn't mean it's the truth and that doesn't mean that i have to behave in a certain way because i'm getting that advice It's not me, it's advice from one region of my brain, and that's it. Well, it's an interesting time right now, Tim, where the economy's changing and there's not that security for people if they decide to take the nine to five and live a classic lifestyle. And then there's the other side of the spectrum where you're becoming a business owner or a creative or an entrepreneur and everything's on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. And we talked about a lot of the stress that goes along with that. So to me, it seems like with those two camps, 
you're going to either have the stress like we just talked about being on your own or if you're working that nine to five, those jobs are becoming more and more slim, more and more layoffs. What do you, what would you say to say you had uh, a teenager right now trying to figure out where should I go in this world? Like what is, where are things going and what's the best route for people to take that's going to be fulfilling, less stressful? Do you have any ideas on that? Absolutely. And it all ties into everything that we've been talking about. Uh, We want to go back to Martin Seligman's model of PERMA positive emotions, which are, which stem from engagement, positive relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. And again, both of those things are facilitated and fueled by a good diet and lots of activity. But our focus should be on building those social networks, building positive relationships, but most importantly, building a positive relationship with yourself. So the accomplishment isn't something that's outside of us. It's not something that we have to achieve in order to be good enough to be a part of the group. The accomplishment is just an acknowledgement that I am fully engaged in something meaningful right now. And as I'm engaged in it, I am enough right now. And I'm accomplishing something in this moment rather than I'm accomplishing something six months from now, a year from now, 10 years from now. When I make the million dollars, then I've accomplished it. No, I'm engaging in the type of thinking, the type of relating, and the type of behaving right now that makes my life rich right now that will eventually add up to greater riches, but I don't care about that because those greater riches really don't have any value if I'm empty when I get there. So I want to make sure that every moment as rich as I don't want the million dollars. I want one dollar and one dollar and one dollar and one dollar. And I want to value those dollars fully rather than saying, oh, who cares about a dollar? It's just a dollar. Yeah, but what is a million dollars? It is a million dollars. If you don't value each one of those dollars as you make it, as you engage in the moments that created it, you're not going to value the million either. You think, oh, dollars only have value if they equal a million. They don't have value individually, and that's the mistake that people make. So they throw themselves into professions that are going to have some long-term lucrative outcome or status outcome. People are going to think really highly of me if I get this kind of job or if I have this kind of business. Not important. Not relevant. You need to be focusing on creating that positive relationship with yourself and your social network and the place that you currently are. So engage where you are. Find meaning with where you are, develop where you are, research where you are, saturate yourself in where you are, and just become brilliant and being you right here. Because you being brilliant right here is going to create something incredible. And I think with you, you've been so consistent creating your online material and you have people that are are listening and, and supporting you all along the way. And you've been so vulnerable throughout the process. And I think that's helped you form really deep connections with people. Do you want to talk on that a little bit? How do you think being vulnerable about things like your depression have allowed you to really connect with people? Well, again, this comes back to first connecting with self. Because if we go back to the model of self-compassion, part of self-compassion is understanding common humanity. So if I'm connecting with myself, I am connecting with other people, not in a selfish way. But if I can connect with the vulnerability and the humanness in myself, then I can also see it, connect with it, and be gentle with it in others. And that's, that's where you really reach people. Now, unfortunately, depending on the culture that you're opening up to, they, not, they may not welcome what you're doing. For instance, the current climate on YouTube is very negative and aggressive. So people in the raw food world or vegan world, they've got some role models right now that are really aggressive and putting out some stuff that I think is really harmful. So that's the climate that we're in. So here I am in that same community and I'm talking about vulnerability and the people that get it, they get it. And man, is that bond incredible. And I've got this incredibly loyal following, but then everybody else in that community is listening to the aggressive, quote-unquote, violent messages, which really lack compassion, even though they're talking about a vegan diet is compassionate, their behavior is far from compassionate. 
their audience is looking at me and saying, oh, he's a crybaby. He's just whining about stuff. He's not doing anything with his life, and it, which is the opposite. I'm, I'm taking steps really powerfully, and I'm using my vulnerability to illustrate how to do that in the midst of challenging emotions, how to do that when you don't feel well, how to get in touch with your feelings and how to work with them to create a powerful step. So uh, my videos are not widely received on YouTube. I have, my audience has shrunk dramatically. Uh, I used to have one of the biggest, I had the biggest vegan channel on YouTube for a while, but that is no longer the case, far from it. And even as my audience has shrunk, the loyalty of the people that follow me has grown. So I'm not going to change what I'm doing. Even if uh, you know the people that want aggressive, violent, negative uh, videos, if that's the demand, that's not going to change what I'm up to because I'm honoring what I believe is more important, which is connecting with that common humanity, that vulnerability that we all share. And that's and, the right people that are going to be drawn to you, right? So these are yes, the people who really yeah. get who you are. So despite that you've shifted maybe your focus or your energies or how you connect with them, the ones who really see you, Tim, for who you are, are the ones who are going to stay loyal. And, you know, it always comes back to quality versus quantity, right? You want those quality people subscribing and watching you because they're going to listen to your message. Yeah, I think it was Seth Godin that said you need a thousand true fans. You don't need a million fans. No. You need a thousand true fans. That's mm -hmm. it. And not that I want fans. You know, I don't want fans at all. I don't want followers. I want people that relate. I mm -hmm. want people that I can connect with, people that I can have real, vulnerable, honest conversations with. That when you're done with the conversation, you're like, wow, okay, that's what life is all about. So important. So, you know, talking about that, I know you've got this green smoothie that uh, you've mentioned before that you make in the morning. So we talked about your salad at the end of the day. Let's just maybe give the listeners something about how you power up in the morning. Are you still making this green smoothie? And if so, what goes into it? I am. Yeah. Right now it's powered by kale out of the garden, which I love. So uh, two to three bananas, um, ripe bananas. And if you can't find ripe bananas, that can be a pain in the butt. So if you go to the store and you see a ton of ripe bananas and you're like, oh, I don't want to buy them because most of them are going to spoil, take them home, peel them, chop them up, put them in a freezer bag, and that way you'll have a steady supply of ripe bananas when you can't find them in the store. So two or three bananas, half to three quarters of a cup of blueberries. Uh, I know blueberries can be expensive. Um, I have an organic blueberry farm. It's, that's what we sell here. So I have blueberries year-round in the freezer. Uh, then I will take... Wow, I would say 10 to 15 large leaves of kale, some spinach, some beet greens, some collard. I pack that blender. So we're talking a one and a half liter blender container. Maybe it might even be a two liter container. I'm not sure. And Vitamix or Blendtec? It's a, it's a Blendtec. Cool. So it's probably close to two liters. And so the bananas and blueberries don't take up a whole lot of space. And I will fill the rest of the container to the top with greens. So we're talking a lot of greens, and I'll really jam them in there good. And now I'm using about a tablespoon of chia seeds. I'm putting uh, some dates or maple syrup in there to sweeten it, and water to about the one liter line. So just enough water to come up to the one liter line, and then when I blend it, it's always a bit more than that. Awesome. But yeah, that, that's my recipe. I rarely change it. I love it. I feel really good eating it. It tastes really good every single time. I never get sick of it. And you've been yeah. doing that for years. I know oh, you've been making yeah. videos and, and showing that years ago. So cool yeah. that you've kept that in your routine. Well, that's the thing. When you're an athlete, you go with what works. You know, you don't want to keep continue experimenting because it's going to affect your training. So you experiment in the beginning, but then once you've got it dialed in, you stick with it. But then again, this works for me. And that's one thing that I'm always really clear about. You need to do your own experimentation. Maybe you might want to use my model as a starting point, but you need to do your own tweaking to find out what works best for you rather than trying to fit yourself into my mold. Two things, Tim. First, yeah. I love your idea with the frozen bananas and I've totally done that over the years where a lot of times you'll get them at half off. Yes. I've been to the grocery store yep. and they have the half off stickers and I'm like, cha-ching. <laughs> I just fill up the cart, go home and, and get those babies in the freezer and and then you're set for like a month or two. So that is totally my way of doing it too. And secondly, do you destem your kale? I do destem the kale. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do too. And I just wondered if uh, 
I've tried a couple times and it just is some about the texture and the flavor. It's hard to get those stems, even when they're pulverized to work in the smoothie. Yeah. See, here's the thing. I've been criticized by taking the kale stems out and I could really care less about that. Here's why I do it. Uh, Most of the nutrients are in the leaves, not in the stem. And the stems are really fibrous. It's hard to break that fiber down, even in a blender. And I'm already getting plenty of fiber. It's not like I need more fiber. And in order for me to blend it to the point where those stems are just purified liquid, I've got to subject that's those ingredients to a lot more heat, a lot more you know metal blades swirling around in a vortex of air causing oxidation. So the longer that I blend that smoothie, the less nutrition it has. That doesn't mean I'm destroying all the nutrition, but I'm taking it from, say, 95%, I'm taking it down to 80% if I continue to blend it until it's perfectly smooth. So I would rather take the stems out, blend it less, and have more nutrition in it. Awesome. Thanks for clarifying that. And Tim, we're going to switch gears and get into a rapid fire question round. So we're just going to ask you a handful (laughs) of questions and uh, we'll have fun with it. How's that sound? Uh, Sounds good. Okay. So first one, as of now, throughout your life, what is your proudest moment? Proudest moment. Wow. I'm sure there's a lot, but what's the first one that comes to mind? Wow. See, immediately my brain wants to go to athletic accomplishments and I don't know if those are my proudest moments. Or maybe not anymore, right? Now that things have kind of evolved. Well, again, you know, it's all about the process. So yeah, I am going to bring it to uh, an athletic event. I was in the U.S. uh, Trail Marathon Championship. So it's it's the U.S. Championships for marathon, but on a trail. Uh, Climbing a mountain in the snow, just crazy conditions with uh, a thousand meters of vertical climb and tough, tough race. And about... I don't know, 30 kilometers in, my legs gave out. And I was in the lead. Uh, Here I am going to get another national championship and my legs are gone and I've got 12 kilometers to go. And I just, I broke down. And I had to piece myself back together mentally and had to take a body that didn't want to function anymore and had to take a mind that had already quit. And I had to rebuild them in the moment to stay in that race and to, to win. Um, and I did. And so it's not so much that I got another championship. It's the fact that what I had to do in order to get it, it wasn't easy. It was the hardest thing I've ever done to pull myself together and to keep going. Wow. And that's a process in itself. <laughs> exactly. And that's what really started me on the path of focusing on the process. Mm-hmm. That was the, the thing that did it for me. Amazing. So another one, what's something that most people don't know about you? Oh, <laughs> uh, I love cats. <laughs> How many cats do you have? Well, I don't have any right now. There are some cats that live here, but I don't really call them my cats. I had one and she died uh, at the end of 2013. And that, that's something I've really had a hard time getting over. Oh, sorry. I, I, I really bond deeply with cats. They're like me. We're introverts. You know, cats are introverts. Dogs are extroverts. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So what is something you're really excited about right now? I want to take the framework that we've been talking about, all the things that create well-being with the addition of diet and exercise, and I want to build a curriculum. I want to build camps. I want to build retreats. I want to get this information out to the masses. I want to help people transform their lives. That's what I'm up to right now. And I love it. Well, it's an amazing message, Tim. And I haven't seen anybody bringing it together in the unique way you are. So we're 100% supporting you and way to go with all you've done so far. Thank you. And I'll invite you guys along. You can be a part of it. We'd love to. So what's your favorite snack on the go? Oh, right now it's cherries. Cherries are in season and I've got a bag of cherries going everywhere with me. Like there's always cherries at my side, in the car, in my office, at my desk, at the home, bag of cherries. Oh, they're so good. And (laughs) I found a couple cherry trees when I was out and about on some walks recently and just picking them right off the tree is magnificent. Yep. So Tim, last one here. If you could go back and give yourself one piece of advice, your 20-year-old self, what would you say? Don't change a thing. Nice. I like that. Because Different direction, yeah. Everything that I am right now and all of the, the messages that I'm inspired to share 
are because of the mistakes that that 20-year-old made. Wow, it's an important message. And we've got one last thing that we ask all of our guests, and that's if there's one thing that we can give to our listeners to reach ultimate health after this episode, what is it? What's something you can give people as an actionable step? Happiness is a choice. It doesn't require an outcome. It doesn't require a result. You can look at the stuff that's in front of you right now, and you can choose to be happy with it. It doesn't need to change in order for you to be happy with it. Happiness is a choice. So this is one of the first steps. Take a look at what you've got. Take a look in the mirror and say, I'm going to start right here, right now with what I've got. The person looking back at me in the mirror, this person is perfect. This person is enough. This is the only person that can actually take a step because this is me. Love it, Tim. And what a way to go out. I'm so glad we ended on happiness like we were talking about earlier. We went deep early on came around, finished with a bang, and uh, that's just wonderful advice. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's been uh, great talking to you more than with you. I'm sorry. I didn't even get to ask you guys any questions. Oh, no. This is (laughs) about you, Tim. This was fun. This was a nice conversation, and uh, I'm sure our listeners are going to be interested in following up after the interview, connecting with you. So what are the best ways of connecting with Tim? Well, the vast majority of what I do is on YouTube. I've continued to make that my primary uh, place of dissemination, so running raw on YouTube. Uh, Right now, I'm going to have some new channels coming out. The new videos that I'm talking about, they're a playlist within running raw, so you'll get to see all my new stuff there. I'm Tim Van Orden on Facebook. I'm also running raw on Facebook. Tim Van Orden on Instagram and Twitter, but YouTube is the best place to find me, or go to runningraw.com and check out all, uh, you know, all the stuff I have there, here to peruse. Well, thank you so much, Tim. And we really had a lot of fun and you brought a whole new realm of great information for our listeners. Well, thank you very much. And I really appreciate this opportunity to um, share with your, your audience. I'm grateful for that. It was a really great conversation and we really enjoyed you know, where this conversation went and we're so excited to get it out to our listeners. Awesome. And we yeah. look forward to connecting with you again when uh, you're up in this neck of the woods or yeah. if we... Uh, come down south a little bit yeah you're only seven hours away there you go that's not bad (laughs) we'll we'll talk about maybe a road trip down the line that's a tank of gas and an audiobook there you go i love it you're you're talking my language podcast (laughs) audiobook you got me in the car for for hours entertained (laughs) all right tim well thanks again and uh we'll be in touch all right thank you and thank you everybody for listening And listeners, our one call to action for you guys, if you could head over to iTunes if you haven't done so already, leave us a rating and review, let us know how we're doing, and that'll just give our show a little boost in the charts, more people are going to find this great information. Please do that if you haven't, and we'll be talking to you guys soon. Have an awesome day.